Well, I have a sort of suggestion, and that is this, that before we decide either to save the planet or to destroy it, we pause for a moment of silence. I don't mean that kind of grim silence which one observes when somebody says, uh, such and such a famous person has just died and we'll observe a moment of silence in his honor. And everybody frowns and thinks very serious thoughts. That's not silence at all. I mean real silence. In which we stop thinking. And experience reality as reality is. Because after all, if I talk all the time, I can't hear what anyone else has to say. And if I think all the time, and by that I mean specifically talking to yourself subvocally inside your skull, if I think all the time, I have nothing to think about except thoughts. And so I'm never in touch with the real world. Now, what is the real world? Some people have the theory that the real world is material or physical and say it's made a kind of a stuff. Other people have the theory that the real world is spiritual or mental. But I want you to point out that both those theories of the world are concepts. They are construction of words. And the real world is not an idea. It is not words. Reality is... You'll find, therefore, that if you get with reality, all sorts of illusions disappear. And I will mention several illusions that have not this kind of existence. Let's begin with some very down-to-earth ones, like money. Money is a very useful method of accounting. It is a measure of wealth, in the same way as inches are measures of length and grams measures of weight. You cannot eat money. You could have a fantastic quantity of dollar bills and uh, stock certificates on a desert island and they would be useless to you. What you would need would be food and uh, animals and companions. Money simply represents wealth in rather the same way that the menu represents the dinner. Only we are psychologically perverted in such a way that we would, some of us would rather have money than real wealth. But you know, you cannot drive in five cars at once, even though they be Cadillacs. You cannot live simultaneously in six houses or eat twelve roasts of beef at one meal. There is a limit to what one can consume. So that's one of the sort of confusions I'm talking about. I once talked to a woman who came to me and said she was afraid of death. And uh, we went into it in a long conversation. I said, what are you really afraid of? And she thought it over and thought it over, and he said, do you know, what I'm going to be afraid of is what other people are going to say. They're going to say, poor old Gert, she couldn't last it through. <laughs> because you see... <laughs> Who you think you are is entirely dependent on who people have told you you are. You're not that. 
Then another thing that bothers, bothers us is time. But most people nowadays say, I have no time. Of course you don't. Because you are not aware of the present. You know, the present is represented on your watch by a hairline that is as thin as possible as is consistent with visibility. And so everybody thinks the present is instead of Now, the present is the only real time. There is no past, and there isn't a future, and there never will be. We think ordinarily of the present as an infinitesimal point at which the future changes into the past. And we also do a terrible thing. We imagine ourselves to be results of the past. And we're always passing the buck over our shoulders, like uh, when God approached Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, Hast thou eaten of the fruit of the tree whereof I told thee thou shouldst not eat? And Adam said, This woman thou gavest me, she tempted me, and I did eat. And God looked at Eve and said, Hast thou eaten of the fruit of the tree whereof I told thee thou shouldst not eat? And she said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And God, out of the corner of his eye, looked at the serpent. The serpent said nothing. So you see, we're always passing the buck. And don't realize that the past is caused by the present, as the wake of a ship flows back from the prow. Now, the wake doesn't drive the ship any more than the tail wags the dog. But we've all got excuses. And my mother had a fit while she was carrying me in the womb. Uh, they didn't bring me up right. And then they go to the mother and say, how is it that you could have been so irresponsible with your children? And she says, well, it was my parents who didn't bring me up right. <laughs> and so everybody passes the buck. But the truth of the matter is it all begins here. This is where the creation begins. And you're doing it and won't admit it. Because, of course, you're all God in disguise. Jesus found that out, and they crucified him for saying so. Because the Jewish people had a sense of God as the cosmic king, the boss. It was modeled on Pharaoh, on Cyrus of Persia. The king of kings and the lord of lords was Cyrus's title. Kyrie eleison means Cyrus have mercy on us. But you don't have to think of God in that image. When modern Protestant theologians of the sort of liberal type are saying God is dead, they mean not that literally, they mean a certain image of God is dead. Outworn. Because it was, after all, an idol. And when it says, Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, it doesn't mean merely images of wood and stone, which nobody took seriously anyway. It means, above all, images made of imagination, images made of concepts. And that one had feet of clay. But it doesn't mean that God is dead, that life is nothing more than a trip from the maternity ward to the crematorium. It's much more spooky than that. Much more wonderful. But you see, you can't conceive reality. We could say God is reality. But if I call this the sound of a gong, it isn't the same as this. You see? The sound of a gong is a different sound from that sound. The sound of a gong, the sound of a gong, the sound of a gong, the sound of a gong is not... <laughs> so then, there is practiced 
throughout the world, rather more in Asia than here, although always by a minority of people, a discipline called meditation, which is to get in touch with reality. The word meditation in English doesn't have quite the same meaning because when we talk of someone meditating, we think of deeply pondering about something. When the Orientals are asked, what do you meditate on, they look slightly puzzled. We don't meditate on anything. We just meditate. In Sanskrit, it is called jhana. In Chinese, it is called chan. In Japanese, it is called zen. And it means, very simply, to stop thinking. Temporary. Not again that thinking is something bad, but if you don't, if you have to stop thinking at certain times. Once you get the knack of that, you can do it even while you're thinking. So you can be a scholar and practice meditation. This is not an anti-intellectual point of view. I imagine that most of you here are uh, either in college or college educated. And the foundation of the intellectual life. Good scholarship requires that you meditate. But in saying that, I have got myself into a linguistic trap because, you see, I seem to be pitching it to you as if it were something good for you. As if it would give you a better future. As if it would improve you. Now, so long as such motivations and considerations exist, you're not meditating. We talk sometimes about the practice of meditation as if it were like practicing the piano, preparing for a concert. It's much more like the practice of medicine, as when you say, well, I practice medicine. It means you do it every day. It's your way of life. So you, this is a very odd thing for Westerners to understand, and particularly for Americans, because we are so fixated on the future. When we say we want to put something down, we say it has no future. Well, do you? Much better to have a present. Because if you don't, it's useless to make plans. Because when they work out, you won't be there to enjoy them. You'll be thinking of something else. So this is one activity which is curiously different from all others. It has no purpose. It's rather like music or dancing in that respect. Why do you listen to music? Supposing there would be a culture with no music, would you consider that a high culture? But why do you do it? Well, some people say, well, we go to the concert to improve our minds. Well, if you do it that, you're not listening. <laughs> As you see, music is peculiar in that it is a marvelous pattern of sounds that doesn't mean anything. There is some inferior music that means something. Uh, what we call program music, like the Tchaikovsky 1812 Overture. Or some of uh, Debussy's perpetrations, such as the Englutted Cathedral. <laughs> Where it's creating visual pictures or imitating natural noises, the beat of horses' hooves, or uh, rollings of military drums, and uh, the sound of the waves, etc. Just imitation. Now, great music, as composed by Bach or Mozart, or uh, the Hindu music, uh, or some of the great contemporary composers, doesn't mean anything except itself. It isn't going anywhere. Otherwise, the fastest orchestras would be considered the best.
So we, in music, become centered. We come into the present. Not a hairline present, mind you. It's an expanded present, because if you had a hairline present, you wouldn't be able to hear one note after another. You wouldn't know what note you'd heard before. So you couldn't hear melody. But in this, you are released into reality. That's why it is said that the angels in heaven have harps, and why they circle the throne of God and sing Alleluia, 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 which, although it does mean hail to the Lord, doesn't really mean anything. When you really get swinging with an Alleluia, uh, it's just Alleluia. <laughs> uh, you don't think of the meaning of it, you see, because you can't think of the meaning of God. What does God mean? What is God useful for? And so in the same way you can ask, what does a tree mean? What does a cloud mean? What does a fern mean? What's it all about? Well, we've got on all kinds of weird theories that the ferns exist in a certain way in order to propagate themselves. Like birds do all this thing in order to lay eggs so that more birds come out. And the whole point of that is that there shall be more birds still. This is a purely engineering approach to life. Uh, which is completely senseless. Things don't mean anything. Birds don't mean anything. Trees don't mean anything. Words mean something, yes, because they point to something beyond themselves. They are signs. But if you take words too seriously, you're like a person who climbs a signpost instead of going where it points. <laughs> 